Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to continue our talk about Ferguson, Missouri, and also the militarization of the police. To me, this has been a very alarming trend that has been a long time coming. Uh, we, saw, we saw the drug war really starting this in the 1970s, where SWAT raids were coming into the country, where the police would break into people's houses uh, late at night, and that steadily increased the number of SWAT raids over time definitely went up. And uh, now we are seeing the militarization of the police in terms of actual military hardware getting into the hands of the police and now on display. The weapons have been being handed over to the police uh, departments since the uh, 1990s. However, they have not really been used until the recent Boston bombing and now in Ferguson, Missouri, to quell the unrest regarding the shooting of Michael Brown, who was 18 years old, uh, down in Missouri. And so, again, this is a very alarming trend because the Posse Comitatus Act was put into place around the Civil War time to make sure that the military was not used as a policing force. And so the way that the government got around that is to actually make the police the military. And if you look at the pictures, you can really see not too much difference. They are wearing basically the same exact body armor, the same helmets, the same uh, weapons that are in their hands as the people who are overseas. And uh, what I really wanted to talk about today was when you create a military that goes around the world imposing America's will on other nations, that is necessarily going to come home to roost in the host country. We saw this in Rome, we saw this in Germany, we saw this uh, time and time immemorial. When we get the government involved with all of these foreign invasions and foreign aggressions against people in other countries, usually that military occupationism comes home to roost in the host country. And uh, I think Justin Raimondo over at antiwar.com really gets this right in an article that he wrote uh, called Ferguson, 10 Days That Shook the Country. And I'd like to read it to you today. The facts surrounding the murder of Michael Brown, an 18-year-old resident of Ferguson, Missouri, gunned down by Darren Wilson, a Ferguson police officer, are not entirely known. But enough is known that it's quite justified to characterize it as cold-blooded murder. Thanks to Brown's family, an autopsy has revealed that of the six shots fired by Wilson, five were survivable, but the sixth, which entered through the top of his head, was not. Although the evidence is not yet conclusive, the forensics and the testimony of eyewitnesses point to the fatal shot being fired as he was falling to the ground with his hands up in the classic posture of surrender. Yet regardless of the circumstances surrounding his death, the significance of this event lies in the reaction to it from the people of Ferguson and, most importantly, from the local state and federal authorities. From the former, anger. From the latter, repression. As citizens of Ferguson took to the streets to protest what they view as a racist attack on their community, the response from the, the authorities was similar to that of the regime of Slodovan Mislovek during the turmoil that eventually ended in the Serbian despot's overthrow. Indeed, the comments of many in the news media, at least 11 at the current count, who were arrested during the proceedings, were that it seemed like something that would happen in a foreign country which hits the nail directly on the head. Much has been said about the shocking militarization of the police, and how this seemed to many like a provocation. Police in Ferguson were encased in armor that one veteran remarked was heavier than anything he wore in Iraq. And now the cry has gone up, demilitarize the police, take away their MRAPs, their forest camouflage, and all the paraphernalia of intimidation that accompanies them into battle. Representative Alan Grayson introduced legislation shortly before Ferguson exploded that would have ended the Pentagon program which funneled this gear into local police departments, but it was voted down. Several newer versions are in the works, and a good thing too, but this is attacking the symptoms rather than the disease. The disease is imperialism, otherwise known as U.S. foreign policy. The underlying condition is the American empire, an international regime of terror and exploitation, which cannot be expected to treat its own citizens much better than it treats its overseas subjects. 
How on earth did we expect otherwise? It isn't just the fact that the Pentagon decided to offload its surplus military gear formerly used to subjugate foreigners onto local police departments. The problem is the culture of imperialism, which has leaked like a poison into the groundwater of American society. It permeates not only public policy, but our art, our literature, and our minds. It is broadcast 24-7 via every media outlet, until it becomes like the air we breathe. Every empire, by definition, is a multinational, multicultural entity. It extends its power over diverse populations who have in common a single conqueror. While this means more open borders and favorable trading arrangements, conditions libertarians would applaud, it also means the methods of state repression and control are universally applied. It means you get hit with the same truncheon that struck some demonstrators in the West Bank. It means, in short, that being a U.S. citizen doesn't immunize you from being traded as you were a member of the Taliban. Mike Brown discovered this too late. To the ruling class, we are all foreigners, outsiders in our own country. Geographically and culturally, they live in a world apart, in the protective enclaves of the Washington-New York corridor, and the details of their lives have as much in common with the ordinary Americans than ours do with the daily routine of an Eskimo. Truly transnational citizens of the world, the Washington elites have more regard for the delicate sensibilities of some Ukrainian oligarch than they do for the average American businessman, because the former suits their purposes while the latter is only a cash cow. The dogma of universalism, which is the official ideology of the empire, dictates that all shall be treated equally. And so why wouldn't our police force present themselves to Americans as our occupying forces confront the peoples we have conquered? Imperialism doesn't recognize national boundaries, and so there's no reason why our rulers should show any regard for the civil liberties of an American citizen any more than they would respect the rights of an Afghan peasant. Just look at the ways and means by which they spy on us. As Edward Snowden revealed, while the legal rationale for scooping up online data supposedly protects U.S. citizens and is unleashed only on foreign communications, in reality the nature of the technology combined with the inherent nature of government to expand its power at every opportunity means that all Americans are subject to the panopticon's unblinking gaze. Racism is an essential ingredient in the alchemy of empire and always has been. America's first venture on the world stage in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War showcased this aspect of the expansionist creed. We were going to lift up the savages of the Philippines and Cuba, educate them out of their native ways, and introduce them to the joys of civilization. And these were the progressives of the day. The sickening ra racism underscored in the wake of Michael Brown's death illustrates the plain fact that the problem didn't disappear with the election of Barack Obama. Instead, it got worse. With Barack I's ascension to the throne, American imperialism was allowed for the first time to wear black face, and in spite of his campaign promises, it helped empower the president to embark on an ambitious campaign of conquest and mass murder that made George W. Bush look like a piker. Libya, Syria, Somalia, Ukraine, and now the stunning turnabout into Iraq. Who would have thought that the liberal and peace candidate who excoriated Hillary Clinton for her vote in favor of the Iraq war would launch such a wide-ranging series of military and, quote, soft power interventions. When one of the provinces rebel, be it in Donetsk or Nevada, the empire's response is identical. The MRAPs assemble in military formation, the long-range acoustic devices are set off, and the helmeted, cami-wearing troops advance toward the crowd, guns pointed at the rebel rabble. It's important to characterize the rebels as mere rabble. This is the whole strategy of the local Ferguson St. Louis authorities, who leaked video of Brown shoplifting from a convenience store shortly before his death. Complementing this, the neocon media has been alight with tales of his rap songs and his alleged criminal history, with the clear implication that he got what he deserved. 
The U.S. government does this routinely to its overseas targets, from inventing stories of incubator babies trampled to merely reiterating irrelevant but nasty stories of the very real crimes committed by Saddam Hussein and others of his ilk. The target of this racist propaganda campaign has been extended to the entire community of Ferguson, which has dared to fight back against a full-scale military occupation similar to those endured by the peoples of Iraq and Afghanistan. The media plays a key role in all this, focusing on the riots rather than their cause, and dwelling in particular on the actions of a few looters, anything to smear the rebels, the dead-enders, as Donald Rumsfeld would put it who insist on resisting the civilizing mission of their betters. Amid this media onslaught, little items like this, the fact that four armed white men were arrested minutes from the central scene in Ferguson yesterday, on Monday, are brushed aside. Yet there's always the danger that the very sight of what is occurring will reveal the true nature of the empire to its subjects, that word of what is really happening will somehow get out. That's why the police assault on the media in Ferguson is a key part of the empire's war plans. For while the political class has absolutely no compunctions about treating Americans the way they treat Iraqis, there is still the illusion in this country that we, as citizens, are exempt from such depredations. Imperialism, wherever it strikes, does its best dirty work in the dark, especially the liberal imperialism practiced by our present rulers. That's why on the morning of day 11, the government line was trotted out. It's the media that's the problem, not Governor Jay Nixon's conquering army of occupation. By exposing the methods of the occupiers, say government officials and their conservative allies, the media has become part of the story, and that's not supposed to happen, or is it? But of course, the media is always part of the story, and a key part at that, whether we're talking about U.S. intervention in Libya or Missouri. Their role is often that of handmaiden to the state, but in this instance they're getting in the way of carrying out the mission, which is to silence the people of Ferguson and crush the rebellion underfoot. Officer Wilson will never be charged, let alone prosecuted. Far worse crimes have been committed by police officers in this country, and they almost always get off scot-free. The reason is simple. The police embody the state, and the state cannot afford to be held accountable for its crimes, which are committed on a daily, nay hourly, basis. To challenge the authority of a police officer to act with virtual impunity is to attack the very nature of all governments everywhere, which are nothing more or less than monopolies on the use of force in a given geographical area. In normal times, it's relatively easy to maintain the illusion of, quote, democracy and liberalism, with elections that are merely contests between two rival gangster clans and a free yet mysteriously complicit media that has by now almost been entirely subsumed into the political class. In times like these, however, the masks come off and the reality of the thug state is revealed in all its brazen ugliness. That's when journalists are arrested and thrown in jail cells along with the rest of the helots, and the MRAPs come rolling down the streets of residential neighborhoods. Yes, the militarization of the police is a bad thing, but it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. The American state in the year 2014, Anno Domini, is unlike any other the world has ever seen. It is not only superior militarily to all possible rivals, it is also imbued with an arrogance and unmitigated hubris of the sort not seen since the Roman Caesars. Most governments in the world limit their sphere of claimed authority to the geographical boundaries inherited from history. While Putin makes his little foray into Crimea, and the Chinese may seek suzerainty over a few disputed atolls, no other nation on earth seeks to extend its monopoly on coercion over the entire surface of the earth. While the soldiers of the caliphate may voice this goal as their ambition, no one with any sense takes them seriously, and for good reason, they can't possibly succeed. Washington, on the other hand, has every intention of succeeding, and our rulers actually believe they have the means to accomplish their goal. Indeed, the expression of this boundless ambition is a staple of American political rhetoric. What U.S. political leader doesn't assume America's solemn obligation to take up the burden of, quote, world leadership and police the globe in the same way we're policing Ferguson? 
After all, anything less is isolationism. In order to do this, however, it is necessary for us to not only outfit our armies with the latest high-tech weaponry, it is also a requirement that we abandon the old-fashioned anti-imperialism of the founders and acquire a certain mindset, one more accommodating to Washington's ambitions. The founders and the revolutionary generation they represented looked on government as a necessary evil and potentially a fearful master this archaic psychology had to be fundamentally changed in order for the state to acquire its present gargantuan condition, and slowly over the years the change has come. From fear to worship is not a very long road to travel, in any event, and in the end our political class has succeeded in pulling off this ideological inversion, at least insofar as a great proportion of the population is concerned. That's why, up until this moment, only a few libertarians like Ron Paul and even fewer old-fashioned liberals objected to the Pentagon to Peoria transfer of military-style weaponry to local poli police departments. This has become routine in American society simply because the American character has changed. Instead of worshipping God or the gods, we burn incense at the altar of government, which is expected to solve all our problems, from how to get health insurance to how to educate our children. Yet the culture of statism is a thin overlay that is thinnest in certain sectors of society, among the rebellious youth and among the most oppressed, i.e. American blacks, whose rebellious impulses have been tamped down over the years by a welfare state designed to buy them off with crumbs from the table of our rulers. Yet every once in a while, the black democratic politicians and parsimonists bribery of the welfare office both fail in their task of pacification, and when that kind of soft power fails, the hard power comes charging down the street in the form of the cops on a daily basis and the National Guard on special occasions. Ferguson is a conquered province, no different in principle from Fallujah after the surge or occupied Gaza. The, quote, crime of the Fergusonians, like the Iraqis and the Gazans, is that they are fighting back. In their incohate, doomed, and heroic way, these much put-upon people, members of a color caste that once wore actual chains in this country, are getting up off their knees and defying the mightiest military machine the world has ever been cursed to know. For ten days, and counting, they have been putting up a heroic resistance that every person who loves liberty must stand and salute. That article was by Justin Raimondo. Uh, he is uh, discussing this on antiwar.com. And we're talking about Ferguson. We're talking about the militarization of the police. The next article I would like to read is by Jeffrey Tucker. He is also going to talk about Ferguson, Missouri, and all of the ongoing things happening there. So uh, his article is called The American War Zone. It's strange how something ominously frightening, the centralized and militarized police state in the U.S., can grow for 15 years at least and yet not enter into public debate. The upheaval in Ferguson, Missouri, has changed that this is all to the good. It means that after the unchecked rise of the police state, the tide might finally be turning the other way. Why the new consciousness? It's not the events themselves. Killings, riot, racial tensions, military-style crackdowns have been with us since the 1960s and actually date back to the 19th century protests against the draft in the Civil War. Probably we can even date this stuff back further to the Whiskey Rebellion. What's different? The cops are scarier and more destructive than ever before. They are omnipresent, and thanks to the democratization of technology, we know more about them than we used to, and hence we are in a position to judge. This is why the war tactics, gear, weaponry, and scorched-earth belligerents of the local police have become such an issue. It's affected all of our lives and every day. Just two days ago, I was at a stoplight at a low-traffic intersection in Atlanta, Georgia. I was changing the setting on my GPS so I could find my way. A cop banged on my window and started screaming at me and threatening me. It was completely disproportionate, scary, fantastically uncivilized, and pointless. It left me rattled and feeling just a bit dehumanized, even if I was in the wrong. I asked him for directions. He dismissed me brusquely and walked off. 
It took 30 minutes for my heart to stop racing. An ex-cop told me last year that it is a well-known fact that any driver anywhere can be followed for one block before some petty violation reveals itself. Once a driver is stopped, it's all over. You can be heavily taxed in the form of a ticket. If you misbehave even slightly with an eye roll or anything that gets on his or her nerves, you can find yourself in a cage within a matter of minutes. That a U.S. senator from the Republican Party has taken note and spoken is a huge political harbinger, writes Senator Rand Paul in Time, quote, Washington has incentivized the militarization of local precincts by using federal dollars to help municipal governments build what are essentially small armies, where police departments compete to acquire military gear that goes far beyond what most Americans think of as law enforcement. When you couple this militarization of law enforcement with an erosion of civil liberties that and due process that allows the police to become judge and jury, national security letters, no-knock searches, broad general warrants, pre-conviction forfeiture, we begin to have a very serious problem on our hands. Given these developments, it is almost impossible for many Americans not to feel like their government is targeting them. Given the racial disparities in our criminal justice system, it is impossible for African Americans not to feel like their government is particularly targeting them. How much has technology contributed to the new awareness? The shooting death in Ferguson was tweeted with an image minutes after it happened. Soon after, Twitter went wild. As the protests and the crackdown began, every smartphone in town recorded the events and broadcast them to the world. The power of coercion has been matched by the power of information. No more killing in secret. No more abuse that is regarded as mere rumor and dismissed. No more cover-ups of official criminality. It's all in the open now. You don't have to have an intense political consciousness to see that this is not the way things are supposed to happen in a free and civilized society, and to see that the police are not keeping order, but are rather inflaming and escalating. In the past, it was common for people who considered themselves to be conservative politically to claim to support freedom and free enterprise, to be against overweening government, but still be huge supporters of the cops. The police were the thin blue line, an essential element of the minimal state. It was only the far left that screamed about police abuse. But it turns out that the government uses the same means and has the same effects in every area of life. It is violent, voracious, parasitical, invasive of property and personal rights. It grows without check, never satisfied with its current level of resources or power. The same government that taxes and regulates the economy also institutes the curfew and releases the tear gas to control the population. The same government that attacks free enterprise also arrests the dope smoker, struts in riot gear, runs the courts, and starts the wars. There is no such thing as a government that only does what you want it to do. Power, once tolerated, invades the whole of life. In some way, it's rather sad that the police rampages are only becoming an issue now that they are profoundly affecting the white bourgeoisie. Black American activists have been shouting about police abuse for many decades. It was for this reason that libertarian activists in the 1960s, Murray Rothbard, Carl Hess, Leonard Ligio, and others, regarded black protests against the police as a sign of hope. What they hadn't anticipated is just how race-focused the police were and how the political damages could be contained so long as the powerless were the main victims. My eyes were only open to the way the criminal justice system has disproportionately abused racial minorities when I spent a day in criminal court. I saw person after person, almost entirely racial minorities, crawl before the judge for petty infractions and find their lives utterly wrecked with the small hit of a gavel on a desk. More fines, no more driver's license, off to jail with you. It was an incredible thing to watch them all chewed through like food for dogs. Watching that scene made me feel as if I had somehow been protected my whole life from what a certain community knows very well. Today, we all know it, and there is no more keeping this issue as the exclusive concern of left radicals. 
Racism may not be the driving motivation behind police work today, but it is the effect, and the effect entrenches mindsets and informal policies. Blacks are the target of police because government-controlled systems of policing and monopolistic justice services need bodies to justify their budgets and power. The path of least resistance is to target communities that reliably lack political pull and economic power to counter the abuse of their rights. They are targeted as a community. That black people think they are singled out is not paranoia. This is not obsession. This is an impression gained from the experience of the reality of everyday life. But power once gained at the expense of one sector of society eventually spills over to everyone, and that's what's happening today. Consider even the way the police are shown today in popular culture. The other day I watched The Amazing Spider-Man, part one of the new series starring Andrew Garfield. It was far better than any previous version I had seen. Peter Parker is not pathetic and put upon, but rather thrilled at his power and happy to use them to make the world a better place. In previous versions, he was heckled and harassed by a newspaper editor who thought he was a menace to the city. But in this version, that role is played by the police, and the chief of police in particular. Why do they regard Spider-Man as a problem? Because he was doing a better job at catching thieves and cleaning up the city than the police were doing. So, of course, the police turned their guns on him. What does this imply? It suggests all the things we now know but did not used to know about the nature of police forces. Their primary interest is not in the public but in themselves, their own safety, their own unlimited power, their own budgets. Anything that makes them look less than wonderful and powerful must be crushed. This is a serious twist in the Spider-Man story and one that fits exactly with our times. The police are shown throughout most of the movie. They wear riot gear. They carry military weapons and machine guns. Tear gas is normal. You can't see their faces through the helmets. They drive tank-like vehicles. Their presence makes the urban environment look like a war zone. Now, if this movie had been made 20 years ago, the reaction would have been, this is completely unrealistic. That's not how cops look and not how cops behave. Or perhaps this is some dystopian plot. No more. The most chilling feature of this movie is that all of this, these scenes are completely realistic. They picture the reality as we currently know it. The good news is that we now know about it. We can thank technology for this, and the application economy that has helped restore the balance in favor of the citizen, putting the power of information in our hands. In the end, knowledge is more powerful than all the weapons in the world combined. That article was by Jeffrey Tucker. He is the Chief Liberty Officer of Liberty.me. And uh, you can check that out on Liberty.me. This article was posted on Antiwar.com. So again, we were discussing on the show the militarization of the police. We are seeing that the police are actually working for the political masters and not for the people themselves, as they claim to do uh, by serving and protecting the people. They're actually there to implement the tyranny and the oppression of the political class. They are there to enforce the laws. They are not there to protect your person and property. And the alternative to this that libertarians and free market people espouse is that we offer competing services in property protection. We do not have taxation-based uh, organizations that provide services, whether or not you like them, by taxation through force. But instead, we have organizations that compete for your dollar. They say, hey, we're really good at protecting people. Hey, we have these people who are very polite, who are going to make sure that your property is not invaded, that we provide uh, services against kidnapping, against uh, people breaking into your house, you know, things like that. This is our previous record. This is what we've been able to do in terms of managing crime rates and bringing crime down in this particular area. Uh, our prices are very low compared to other producers of that particular good and so you have a competing market as you do with any other good or service on the market so i hope that you enjoyed this show um this has been the austrian circle i hope that you tune in next week at 11 o'clock for another episode we are going to have dr walter block on the show then so i hope you have a great week take care